Welcome to this installment of Business Battleground. In today's edition, we take a look at Ground Zero for Copyright, YouTube's Content ID. The purpose of copyright is not actually to protect intellectual property. The purpose of copyright is to encourage the arts and sciences and fair use or fair dealing, either through commentary, criticism, parody, satire, is also protecting and growing the arts and sciences. In that context, when someone creates an intellectual property, they own the rights to that asset and basically own derivative rights, meaning they can make copies of that underlying asset. However, if you were to take that full work and transform it enough, ergo making it transformative, then you are exempted from copyright infringement. And if you were to take parts of that underlying asset and either comment on it, criticize it, review it, rank it, mash it up, then you are also exempted from copyright infringement. We are going to be using the concept of fair use, which is popular in the US, and fair dealing, which is more popular in Canada and UK and Australia, interchangeably. In this video, we're gonna define fair use. Then we're gonna talk about WatchMojo's experience over a decade fighting off some of these claims and naming abusers of content ID. Finally, we're gonna actually talk about some of the options that channels like WatchMojo have when they get these claims. Some of the tactics include, frankly, going public like this. Another one is just using the DMCA process to send back counter notification. A third one is seeking injunctive relief. Then you could even consider a class action lawsuit. And finally, we'll explore, is there a solution through antitrust? You can't talk about copyright without first talking about the Digital Millennium Copyright Act or the DMCA. As we've touched on in a previous installment of Business Battleground, the DMCA ultimately provides UGC, user-generated content platforms such as Yahoo and Google and Facebook and YouTube, certain protections under copyright as well as hate speech so long as once they have been notified, then they decide that they have to take it down or not. By virtue of being the largest search engine, Google obviously benefits and is protected given safe harbor under the DMCA. In 2006, Google bought YouTube. Google's success could be attributed to a perfect storm. We'll cover that on an upcoming episode. But when Google bought YouTube, YouTube benefited from the fact that Google had considerable legal experience combined with financial and ad sales support to allow YouTube to prosper under the DMCA for safe harbors. YouTube's legacy lies in piracy. When the trio from PayPal launched the platform to allow them to share the Janet Jackson Super Bowl video, it ushered a wave of other pirated content like NBC's Lazy Sunday. When Sequoia funded the company, they had a little bit more resources to fend off legal complaints, and then when Google acquired YouTube, it gave them considerable confidence to stay on that path. But now being a part of Google, YouTube recognized that it needed to address the piracy risk. At around that time, YouTube began to invest in Content ID. To understand how Content ID works, think of a tennis court. Early on, YouTube would give claimants the ability to issue a strike and take down the video on another channel that they felt was uploading content that was infringing their copyright. So in this scenario, imagine WatchMojo produces top 10 FIFA scandals, which is commentary news, and FIFA comes along and says, hey, you're using some footage from our sports matches. We want you to take it down, strike, content disappears. WatchMojo could then come along and say, no, 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 this is protected by fair use as it's a commentary news element. Using just a little bit of your works, we think that this content should stick up. FIFA gets that claim and they could decide if they feel strongly enough and want to enforce the strike or let it slide. If they want to enforce the strike, then ultimately they need to go to court, get a filing, prove to YouTube that this is a matter that they're escalating and are dead serious about, at which point YouTube will leave the content down for good. Content ID is a double-edged sword. I like to think that content ID is part of the solution, but it also comes with a set of problems. Like a weapon of mass destruction, it has spillovers. Google boasts that it spent $60 million developing the technology behind Content ID, which has gone on to pay rights holders a billion, then two billion, then even three billion dollars each year to encourage them that instead of issuing strikes, they should leave the content up and simply claim it. Ultimately, it's important to think that YouTube is a UGC platform. They don't care who claims the content so long as somebody claims it, therefore they could sell ads against it and do a revenue share. As you can imagine, this is a system ripe for abuse. Eventually, YouTube wisened up and said, you know what, 
Instead of issuing strikes, FIFA, why don't you simply claim this video, make it your own, and we basically get to share ad revenue with you. Now, WatchMojo could still reiterate that it's fair use and kind of serve and volley the ball back over the fence, and this process can go back and forth. Ultimately, FIFA can still issue a time-delayed strike saying you should retract your position or we'll enforce that the clip goes down. At which point, we're back to the first scenario where we could issue a counter notification, and unless FIFA wants to go to court, then technically we prevail. So the problem with this scenario is, is as you are volleying the ball back and forth and eventually it becomes an exploding grenade, you feel the ground from underneath you being pulled. Because under YouTube's three strikes you're out rule, if you have three strikes, your channel gets taken down. When you start to look at copyright and investigate fair use cases, you realize that Google is actually bypassing copyright law through its decisions and policy with Content ID. A claimant needs to go to court, prove that something is infringing on its copyright, and then demonstrate that it damages the value of their IP, at which point the court determines the amount of damages. What YouTube is doing is tilting the playing field a little bit to the claimants where it gets to be judge and jury. Now, in of itself, that's not the end of the world. YouTube is a private organization, publicly traded, can make decisions as it sees. The problem is Google is not just any company. You're probably watching this on YouTube. You might have found this video using Google search. You may be watching this in Google's Chrome browser. And I can tell you that I prepared this presentation using Google Slides and I shared it to my colleagues on Google's Gmail. You see where this is headed, don't you? To quote one of my favorite legal mentors, Chris Rock, just because you could drive with your feet doesn't mean you can. What does that mean? Think of it this way. If Entertainment Tonight decides to talk about the latest Avengers movie and show a little bit of like the, the scenes from the movie, well, they don't need to share any of the revenue with the studio. If the New York Times runs an excerpt from a book in, as part of their book review and sells ads all around that page, it doesn't share revenue with the underlying publisher. When SNL parodies something, a trademark or a person, again, it does not share revenues from the ads that it sells. Media companies incidentally understand this. It's been easier for us to navigate the landscape with media companies who themselves rely on fair use than with YouTube who tilts the playing ground in favor of the claimants. So just because the technology allows you to do something doesn't mean that it's rooted in law. Now, depending on how you landed on this video, by now you're asking, what is WatchMojo and who is this guy? So WatchMojo is one of the largest 25 channels of all time on YouTube. We start off with a vision and mission to produce a video on every topic to inform and entertain audiences. We were producing makeup tips, travel videos, cooking recipes, as well as interviews with celebrities and top 10 lists. When we do interviews with celebrities, the very same rights holders that sometimes we find ourselves disputing these claims with would ask us and induce us to cover their artists and new releases. From 2006 to 2012, nobody bothered us, partly because there was no money to be made on YouTube. Let's be candid. Once YouTube became profitable and successful and YouTube emerged as ground zero for video advertising and enabled claimants to get aggressive through Content ID, then we started to get a lot of disputes and had to fight the fight for fair use. So to make sure this doesn't get lost, we by and large have very good relationships with rights holders. And we recognize that YouTube is caught between a rock and a hard place. And the last thing we're looking for here is any sympathy or pity. We're simply outlining how WatchMojo has been able to navigate through copyright and fair use and outline how the abuse by some rights holders of Content ID does lead to possible antitrust risk. Now, what is fair use? Fair use boils down to four tests, which I've coined the acronym PAIN, Purpose, Amount, Impact, and Nature. Prima facie, at face value, WatchMojo's videos pass all four tests. The purpose of our videos are commentary, mashups, criticism, and by virtue of taking all these short clips of longer works and putting them together, you can argue it's also transformative. Two, the amount that we are using of the underlying works are fairly inconsequential. The impact that we have on the underlying works is not only not negative, but it actually helps. And lastly, the nature of the works that we use are not things like stock media whose only purpose and raison d'etre is to be commercialized, but instead 
media like movies and songs and TV shows that benefit from the promotion we provide. And the following is critical. If you were to go on Twitter right now and search for classroom professors, watch mojo, teacher presentation, you'll see before your eyes that there are thousands and thousands of educators and teachers and students who use our videos to teach English, complement their textbooks. Our videos are actually educational and that gives us almost a crazy shield to defend ourselves in any possible litigation. Now, our lawyers would want me to state by way of disclaimer that I am not a lawyer, although I've spoken and interviewed over a hundred lawyers in the areas of copyright, litigation, business, licensing law, and my opinions here are essentially a condensed summary of over 10 years of research and on the field expertise. And on the grounds and in the trenches, over the past decade, we've successfully defended over a thousand disputes, many of which were largely frivolous and meritless, and in which ultimately the claimant, be it an owner right holder or an intermediary, didn't see how they would possibly win at the merit stage. And if you think about it, if 10 years ago I told you that we'd start a business, we'd fair use clips without licenses, we'd then build a business around that, and then we would proceed to go and get those very same rights holders to come and want to partner with us, you would have thought we were crazy. It's not that we were crazy, it's that our position was legally sound. Now by now you might be asking, Ash, why don't you go out there and actually get permission or partner with these companies to get the rights? Setting aside the merits of that argument, even when we partner with rights holders, as we did recently with Universal Studios to recreate Jurassic World in a chain reaction machine, you'll see that our videos still get picked up by Content ID because Content ID is not only not perfect, but it's ripe for abuse. Our success boils down to three things. One, we understand the law. Two, we have relationships with rights holders that we know when to push on without necessarily going to them and asking them for permission when we don't really need to do so. And three, we apply common sense to avoid picking on fights that we know are probably not worth it. And then when it comes to the law, if you double click on that, to succeed you need to have the right mix of litigation experience, copyright know-how, as well as contract business law. We have succeeded where others have failed because we actually take the time to read the court cases. We don't simply pay lip service. There's a lot of back and forth with rights holders and that requires a lot of patience. And sure, there's an element of fearlessness and masochism that comes with the territory. But ultimately, our videos are not infringing. They cause no damages. Now you're probably wondering about these so-called fair use precedents. So here we go. One, commentary like news and parody is exempted from copyright law. Two, producing a video like ours, the mashups, the commentary, the short clips, and making them available online for consumers to watch for free is not even deemed to be commercial in the context of copyright. Three, some commercial use does not automatically nullify fair use. That's a common misconception. Four, there are actually instances where companies like WatchMojo and individuals who've produced these works that are protected under fair use have been able to go back and counter sue and prevail, arguing that the claimant was acting in bad faith. And that's a key aspect, acting in good faith and considering whether a video is fair use before issuing a strike. There are many other cases and I link to them all below, but ultimately as a Canadian corporation, and this is critical, fair use is not merely a defense. In a landmark 2004 Supreme Court case, fair use was proven to be an extension of user rights. By and large, over the last decade, we've worked behind the scenes and lobbied YouTube to reflect copyright law. We've also published some articles, but we haven't really gone full out public to outline our concerns, but especially with Article 13, or finally Article 17 passing in the EU, we feel like it's time to escalate and look at all the options available to companies and individuals like WatchMojo who do rely on fair use and don't like the trends as they are headed. There's a lot of nuances that we're not gonna get into this video. Sometimes a claimant is the actual owner. Sometimes the claimant is an intermediary. Sometimes a claimant could be a big major corporation. And sometimes a claimant is just an individual creator who uploaded their video and feels somebody is infringing on their copyright. But the fundamental bottom line is, fair use, while is determined on a case by case basis, is not selective. If you as a gamer take gameplay from a video game and put it online and somebody else then fair uses that, you can't argue that fair use applies to you when you're using Nintendo's footage, but then doesn't apply to you if someone else fair uses your work. Moreover, if you're a big studio and is promoting its works and trying to get WatchMojo to cover you and promote your new release, then you can't come back and object when we actually do produce a top 10 using your works. For over a decade, we've highlighted cases where rights holders have abused Content ID. We've done so privately, 
And as much as we've taken a tough stance in bilateral discussions, we're now actually going to shed a light on a few bad practices. One of the most outrageous cases that I ever encountered was this company called Orpheum, or Hexacorp, that issued a claim when we commented on an Avengers trailer. They emailed me, and to my bewilderment, Orpheum Exacorp was arguing that our use was outside of the scope of the license that the composer of the song had licensed that song to the studio, which was Disney. Now, naturally, this didn't make any sense, and we pushed back and we prevailed. But I did reach out to many other channels who were wary of fighting back because they were afraid of the three strikes you're out conundrum. So this is an example where this company definitely issued a frivolous claim against us and allegedly profited unlawfully from money that should have gone to these other channels that did not dispute the claim. Another company, In Grooves, emailed me and basically objected to us doing a top 10 Mac Miller songs and in their email to me actually outlined why we were actually protected under fair use. I didn't take that lying down, so we replied and we copied their investors, highlighting that In Grooves was exposing itself to a class action lawsuit. Suffice to say, they let the matter slide and we prevailed. Another company was Zephyr, who was at one point just claiming so many of our videos that it was becoming hard to manage. After a lot of back and forth through emails and through Content ID, I had had enough and actually just went on a job review website and I copied and pasted certain reviews that their employees had made that confirmed that Zephyr was giving an incentive to their employees to claim videos even if they should not. That was a little bit savage, perhaps, but you don't show up to a gunfight with a spoon. The fundamental issue time and time again wasn't so much that these individual organizations or people were just waking up and acting maliciously, but it was that content ID was ripe for abuse. Some of the worst and the worst are the publishing units of these record labels. Today, we have great relationships with Sony Music and Warner Music, but their publishing units will claim anything and everything. For example, say there is a song that is used in the soundtrack to Family Guy, they will claim the entire Top 10 Family Guy countdown, even if five seconds of their song is used in the background. We fought the fights with copyright societies, we've convinced the record labels to leave us alone, but the bottom line is that Content ID is ripe for abuse, and these companies have a financial incentive to abuse it. It's a numbers game. The worst part is when these people act dumb and just pay us lip service. When I explain to a copyright society, Audiam, that we did not need to ask permission to do top 10 Bruno Mars songs and hinted that abuse of content ID leads to litigation, Audiam's rep turned around and said, are you really going to sue Bruno Mars? I was thinking, no, I'm thinking of suing you. Now, obviously, we have bigger fish to fry than sue anybody, but time and time again, Content ID is abused. Now, I know what you're thinking, Ash, these are just a few bad apples, but even CBS, who is a staunch believer in freedom of expression, fair use, has been known to abuse the system. They emailed us last year and objected when we used a little bit of a James Corden episode in one of our videos. I replied initially fairly diplomatically, citing court cases and precedents, and at some point I said, would you really object if we were to do some kind of expose using the same footage, talking about how your CEO has been abusing women, or if James Corden is objectifying women? Of course you wouldn't. The cases go on and on. FIFA objected when we did a Watch Mojo news video talking about FIFA scandals. Again, that's outright censorship. From a legal perspective, fair use is an extension of the freedom of press and media. And to me, not just because of that 2004 Supreme Court case, it's actually just an extension of your freedom of expression. Maybe my vantage point is a bit different as an Iranian born who moved to Canada, but I've seen firsthand what happens when totalitarian regimes are allowed to impede on one's freedom of expression. You would think that countries in the EU, France, Germany, Italy would have a better appreciation for our position, but yet they don't because Content ID makes it too easy for them to impede on our rights. When Toei Animations, who is known for its anime franchises, and emailed us to say that our usage was not respecting their internal copyright policies, I reminded them that fair use is an exemption to copyright law, not just your internal policies. But I didn't stop there. I couldn't help but think of Don Draper's character in Mad Men, who said, if you don't like what's being said, change the conversation. So I did. 
I reminded them that we have actually two constituencies on Watch Mojo, either employees or our audience. We have fans of anime and those who aren't such big fans. And I asked her if she would object if we were to take a very critical stance and look at the impact of anime on things like bullying and depression and objectification of women. The point I'm making here is there's no real difference between positive commentary and negative criticism. Fair use does not differentiate between those two. Now let me also up the ante a little bit and put a spotlight on our harshest critics who will say, you know what Ash, but why don't you guys just stop using other rights holders IP, produce originals. Now for one thing, we have over half of our 25,000 video catalog consists of full original content including scripted comedies and live shows and whatnot. But at the same time, it's important to remember that we have rights holders like record labels, movie studios, TV networks, gaming publishers, who have asked us and induced us to basically promote them and cover them through our editorial. Finally, it's perfectly fine to criticize us for our fair use reliance, but that's the whole purpose of fair use, which allows for criticism. What pushed me to do this video was our recent exchanges with BMG. It's important to note that our relationship with BMG actually goes back over a decade to the time when Sony and BMG were one label, and Sony was asking us to effectively become their in-house video team. Today, who is BMG's parent? German giant Bertelsmann. Bertelsmann is not only a giant in German society, but also a pillar in the European media landscape, with extensive reach and operations all over the world, including North America. Bertelsmann owns many things, including the Random House Publishing House, but for the context of this video, owns BMG as well as RTL, the parent of Fremantle. They also have an investment vehicle called BMDI, Bertelsmann Media Digital Investments. BMG has an exclusive relationship with ERISA, a copyright society that gives it the right to manage BMG's copyright in about 70 markets in Europe, Asia, the Middle East, and Africa. So when BMG and Arisa claim our videos or issue strikes, immediately I see two issues. One, why are they issuing global strikes when Arisa does not have jurisdiction rights in North America? And two, why is Arisa claiming 100% of our views and revenue credit when really less than 10, 20% of our usage relies on their IP, which setting aside fair use and the fact that we don't need their permission to do a mashup commentary, you would think would be them overextending their rights. Indeed, BMG's employees have themselves confirmed that ERISA only has rights in certain jurisdictions. Remember, claimants can block a given video in a given geography. In this example, there's a claimant who's blocking our videos in USA or Canada. So when we see BMG and Arisa issue frivolous, meritless claims that harm our channel and paralyze our ability to operate, we're left to wonder, is this acting in good faith? Is this competition? Is this anti-competitive behavior and abuse of copyright tools that are not intended to be used in such a manner? when you actually look at the full details. Warner Music has gone on and said that we would never initiate anything against WatchMojo as we view WatchMojo as a legitimate and valuable media partner. Many documentary like yours should indeed be no problem. They certainly help us promote the artists, end quote. Now, I may object to the word mini, but I'll take that. Bertelsmann also owns RTL, which is an owner of Fremantle that produces shows like The X Factor. So on the one hand, you could argue that they're just protecting their IP. Now say we wanted to do top 10 reasons we love The X Factor and why Simon Cowell is amazing. We already should be able to do that without their permission. But what if we wanted to do Simon Cowell is a bully, he's responsible for kids who are depressed in school, and his behavior leads to suicide. Do you think we really need their permission to produce such a video? No, absolutely not. Again, there should be no distinction between positive commentary and negative criticism. But what makes that hard is YouTube tilts the playing ground towards these claimants who have no incentive to come to the table and negotiate in good faith. For purposes of transparency, RTL actually asked us if we'd be open to a commercial partnership, which in theory we are, but they don't have any incentive to actually negotiate in good faith because they can use that tennis court analogy, three strikes you're out rule. The issue we have is that by tilting the playing field towards rights holders, we can't even come to the table in good faith and negotiate some kind of resolution. To further illustrate that this is again not only about Bertelsmann or RTL, their competitors at Endemol tried to extort us last year as well. Now I like to think I'm a reasonable person. When I was reading I Want My MTV, I saw a parallel between the day when Bob Pittman decided to open up the checkbook and partner with the record labels without setting a precedent. The record labels had initially given the channel 
all of their music videos at no cost. MTV eventually built a big business. You can imagine over time the record label said, show us the money. Bob Pittman was wary of setting a precedent where all of a sudden he'd be paying for something that he was previously getting for free. So he said, aha, in exchange for an exclusivity window to these music videos, I'm going to give you some money. Similarly, we're totally open to the concept of these commercial agreements in exchange for our channels to be whitelisted and left alone, but mainly so we can actually pursue broader commercial opportunities. If ever someone like Bertelsmann wanted to pursue us for copyright infringement, they would have to come to courts showing that they're acting in good faith. This is when I want to introduce the concept of clean or dirty hands. Bertelsmann, through BMDI, has investments in multiple buckets, including online video. They are an investor, control, majority investor in Broadband TV and Style Hall, which indirectly compete with us for audience and mindshare on YouTube. But they're also investors in our direct competitors. When you step before a judge, the key is to demonstrate a pattern of behavior. Over a decade ago, when we chatted with BMDI about a possible investment, their partners passed on us like a hundred others. No hard feelings. When I would see them at events, we'd say hi and move on. But then in 2017, like many others, one of their partners got in touch with me and asked me if we could, I quote, compare notes. This is 2017, at which point I proceeded to send them some confidential info on the company after which point, they said that it wasn't a fit for them and they moved on. A year later in 2018, I noticed that they were an investor in our direct competitor going back to 2014. If I'm complaining about YouTube's guilt before innocence position, then I'm not going to act as judge and jury and accuse BMDI of impropriety. I'm just saying that the pattern doesn't look good if you're Bertelsmann. By virtue of being an investor in our direct competitor, then BMDI, Bertelsmann, is acting in bad faith. Bertelsmann, through their investment arm, BMDI, has invested in our direct competitor, Zergnet, whose assets, Looper and Nikki Swift and a bunch of others compete with us for the same audience, fighting for the same ad dollars, competing for the same eyeballs. Now, a word on competition. I love it. Competition is good. That scene in Wall Street, greed is good? No, competition is good. Competition forces us to stay honest. Competition allows me to tell my team we need to work harder. What we object with is unfair competition, is using a tool such as Content ID that is intended for copyright to hurt us in the marketplace, benefiting Bertelsmann Direct Investment, which is our direct competitor. Once we show that pattern and can demonstrate the proof, then we're saying that this is no longer about copyright, it's actually about anti-competitive behavior. Without a doubt, the EU is far more in favor of rights holders than it is those who push for fair use. But the EU is also far more against companies that abuse their dominant market share to act in anti-competitive ways and raise antitrust issues. If you connect the dots, because YouTube tilts the playing field towards rights holders, then Bertelsmann feels emboldened to abuse the system which basically then acts unfairly onto WatchMojo that competes with their direct investment. That's the pattern, and that's how the optics look bad, and once you're able to demonstrate that, then you could possibly pursue antitrust issues. So part of the purpose of this video is to outline all of the options that are available to channels like WatchMojo when they are being unfairly attacked through Content ID. When I think of antitrust, I can't help but think of the case Microsoft versus the government where David Boies basically dismantled Bill Gates and ended up demonstrating that Microsoft had indeed acted in bad faith by bundling their Internet Explorer browser into their operating system. Why is this pertinent? The line of thinking is that competition is good, monopoly is bad, and abuse of power is very bad. Think damages, think Standard Oil, think AT&T, the original AT&T before it got shattered into pieces. By its very nature, intellectual property creates a monopoly around those rights, and that's why fair use is an exemption to those rights. Thus, the existence of intellectual property rights are not anti-competitive, but the exercise of intellectual property rights are anti-competitive in certain cases. Which cases? A case like this, where you have a rights holder, Bertelsmann, who is abusing Content ID in a manner that no longer simply protects their IP, but rather harms the competition. Now you may be wondering why not give BMG the benefit of the doubt. Well, for one reason, BMG's done this kind of thing before. A few years ago, they ignored parody 
and they issued a strike against one of the ads that Mitt Romney was using. Seriously, Mitt Romney can't catch a break anywhere. Again, you may be thinking, but Ash, why do this video? Why not simply reach out to Bethel's man? Maybe this is just all a big misunderstanding. After all, you go on their website and they have this snazzy section called Speak Up, all about corporate responsibility. My bias, I won't lie, is that corporations are hypocrites and they're a bunch of phonies. And when they put up these nice pages, it's not because they actually want to resolve anything. It's because there's some government body that forces them to do so and it looks good. So I did. I reached out to Dr. Olaf Christensen and Dr. Christina Muller, who are in charge of integrity and compliance, as well as Dr. Philip Koenig, who is in charge of antitrust. I also went all the way to the top to the CEO of Bertelsmann, RTL himself, Thomas Rabe, as well as their ombudsman. And after emails and more emails and some public tweets, I finally, to their credit, got a response. Notwithstanding the merits of the discussion, what I find particularly interesting is how this German company is citing content to ID as if it's basically law and not actually how YouTube interprets and applies the law. That is another problem that we now face where companies and individuals are conditioned to think that content ID equals copyright law. This game of cat and mouse continues, but because of YouTube's three strikes are out rule, unfairly penalizes WatchMojo, even though our videos are prima facie fair use, similar rights holders have said that our videos are helpful, and specific court cases have even concluded that a rights holder like BMG should consider if the video could be fair use, which they are not acting as judge and jury. Finally, the fact that through BMDI, they are an investor in our competitor just raises a whole set of issues that YouTube should take into consideration when determining content ID policy. In the fall of 2018, I had had enough, and in the mother of all reverse psychology tricks, I contacted all of the senior execs at the major record labels and told them that unless they would leave us alone, we would no longer promote their artists or their releases to our audience of a quarter billion people. I didn't think anything would come out of it, but one by one they started to get back and said, no, oh, you know what, before you totally walk away from this, let's see if there's a common ground. We started to work with Sony Music and Warner Music and we're discussing with Universal. BMG remains the fickle, thorny rights holder that they've always remained, which is fine. But even then, when you consider that BMG claims to be the fourth record label in the world and we work with the second, Warner, and third, Sony, then you have to ask yourself, Again, is BMG's stance against us further anti-competitive behavior? So if this video is about options, then the first route has always been to cite copyright law to get YouTube to fully reflect what the law says. The route two that I've considered, and which is really not a very savory one, is to actually seek injunctive relief. Remember in 2006, I successfully defended against an injunction? Well, it's quite harder to secure one. So even though we could argue that we have an apparent right, that we would prevail at the merits, that the balance of inconvenience is our favor, meaning if our channel goes down, we're dead, but if we produce top 10 Nickelback songs, nobody really is harmed by that. Well, and we are caused irreparable harm if our channel goes down and finally there's urgency to address this, therefore we need a, an injunction. The reality is that would ultimately spill over against YouTube, which remains our preferred trading partner, not an ideal reality. But as I was talking about this, one thing I realized is this concept of class action lawsuit. If you think about it, what happens with Content ID is that it amplifies each claim a claimant makes. Content ID is this multiplier where a rights holder comes, leverages this platform of CID, and gets exponentially more claims going out, and through basic statistics, they see what sticks against the wall and what is bounced back. So even if a number of channels successfully appeal and prevail, through just the law of big numbers, the claimant essentially benefits from some valid claims that it deserves to enforce, but also like that Orpheum Exacorp scenario, benefits unlawfully from videos that they should not be claiming. Hmm. At this point, I start to ask, is there a way that instead of counter appealing and issuing counter notifications on a one by one basis, could all of these channels that are the subject of these frivolous claims line up alongside and behind one representative partner and pursue a class action lawsuit against these rights holders like Orpheum Exacorp and many others who are clearly, allegedly acting in anti-competitive abusive practices. Now it may not work, as we all remember what happened to the Death Star, but in this analogy, 
I'm not quite sure which side represents the Death Star. I alluded to at least one other channel that also was a victim to Exacorp's abusive behavior. If you have similar cases you'd like to share with me confidentially, email me at WTFU at watchmojo.com, which stands for Where's the Fair Use? Now there's a specter haunting EU, and sure that's Article 13 or 17, but it's more than that. Europe may have won this battle, but it's gonna lose the war, not just because the web is gonna become balkanized in that continent, but ultimately if you think about it, under Article 17, I would not be able to upload this video to a UGC platform like YouTube, because if you recall, I used pictures of the Bertelsmann executives off of Bertelsmann website without their permission. The reason I didn't ask for their permission wasn't because they would not give it to me, but it's because to produce such a video, you don't want a channel like WatchMojo to need to ask for permission to do so. It defeats the whole purpose of media and press. And there's a lesson here for YouTube as well. YouTube could have been more proactive in the EU and proposed solutions that would have appeased rights holders in the old continent. But it didn't do so, and ultimately the lobbyists representing the Bertelsmanns and the actual Springers had to go out and draft the most outlandish resolutions that ultimately made their way before each country for them to vote on, creating a far bigger problem for YouTube than they would have ever imagined. Eventually, somebody crazier than me is gonna come along, put the pieces together, and realize that Content ID is the Death Star, is the weapon of mass destruction, is this double-edged sword that does just as much harm as it does good, and possibly, not for me to decide, but possibly leads to anti-competitive, abusive power that leads to antitrust issues. So that's the other route that someone can take, although, again, unlikely and possibly even unadvisable. Once again, you might be thinking, but Ash, why not reach out to Google? After all, they wanna do no evil. Susan seems like she's a very googly person. And don't you fear retaliation by Google, which recently was in the news for retaliating against employees who aired their concerns regarding something else. The truth is that I have. And look, I get it. YouTube is caught between a rock and a hard place. They're a company whose own insecurity and origins through piracy has made them extremely paranoid first about rights holders, and their tremendous success in the marketplace has rendered them super paranoid about governments coming and trying to shake them down or ratchet them away from their parent Google. So you may be wondering, well, what are these solutions? What are these changes that YouTube could make to improve Content ID? Now, there's things that we've proposed that they've implemented, and there's things that they've ignored, and that's life. We don't have a sense of entitlement when it comes to these things. But one of the things that we like that they've recently introduced is that like a claimant has to outline the timestamp to where they allege you are infringing on their content. That's a good change. Another change we'd like to see is whether the claimant is the owner of a content or if they're an intermediary representing said content. But Three, fundamentally, let's stop pretending that one size fits all. There is no reason for YouTube to be a one platform for all channels, pretending to be this platform for UGC content. The reality is, today, there need to be two tiers of channels. Professional media organizations that have errors and emissions insurance who indemnify YouTube, who are running legitimate businesses that do not contravene any law, versus little Joey who uploads a video to his channel and may eventually become the next big YouTuber. Now there's a lot of other things that may not be practical, but imagine if each time a claimant were to issue a claim, they had to put up like a $1 bond and if ever that claim was frivolous, then they would lose it. That would give them a little bit of a disincentive from just carpet bombing all of YouTube with these claims, by and large, 99% of are frivolous. I'm not gonna use the M word, but I will use the word utility. YouTube is no longer this website that one can choose to be on or not. But speaking of the M word, it appears to me that the Google and YouTube staff, who are really all way too smart for their own good, are risking overthinking this and being too smart for their own good. Think about it. One cannot both argue that, well, we are so big that we need to be extra careful not to get the government or these rights holders to come after us, but also then claim that, no, 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 we're not that big at all. There's nothing to see here. Please go over and go visit Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook. When Time Magazine was founded, it would basically take the Daily New York Times articles, condense them, summarize them, and then publish a weekly summary 
that became Time Magazine. Now imagine if New York Times didn't like that practice, but instead of going to court and asserting its rights and demonstrating that Time Magazine was indeed violating New York Times copyright, imagine if the New York Times just decided to shut off the electricity or remove Time's ability to use the post office. That would not be competitive behavior whatsoever. That would be anti-competitive, abusive antitrust. That's what these rights holders are doing when they abuse content ID. The last option obviously is going public. Why are we doing this video? Part of it is we're tired. And I get it, YouTube's probably tired of us as well. We're not asking YouTube to do anything that we are not allowed to do under law. We understand that they're caught between a rock and a hard place, but we're also not sure why they keep throwing us under the bus. When it comes to antitrust, there's always this thought that it's the government that has to go after somebody. Think government versus Microsoft. But the reality is that individuals and companies can also file antitrust cases if they can cite that there was some kind of unfair anti-competitive behavior. And to be crystal clear here, I'm not going on the record and accusing Google or YouTube of antitrust behavior here. I'm just saying their tools are being abused by some who may be. It kind of seems strange that a decade after doing this, we still find ourselves having the very same conversations with YouTube, which is, we don't want any favors, we just want to be able to do what the law allows us to do. And it's kind of a weird dynamic. I find myself in this Mexican standoff with YouTube here and a rights holder there, or more likely that I'm trying to take out an abusive kidnapper without harming the hostage. I don't know where the analogy is, but I guess our YouTube channel is ultimately the hostage. So. As a creative, as an entrepreneur, as a storyteller, this is just a, another problem to solve. I'm not sure if the answer lies in an injunction. Definitely don't wanna pursue the antitrust route. And I'm not sure if the class action lawsuit makes any more sense, but eventually somebody's gonna figure it out, put the pieces together, and realize that there's probably an opportunity to be made here because there's always a regression to the mean. And clearly, we've tilted way too much to one side where rights holders are abusing content ID. And when that's the case, somebody comes along, pushes back, and spots an opportunity. Thank you for watching. If you have any questions, let me know. Feel free to email us, subscribe, follow, and tell us what you think about this.